All righty. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the January 2021 meeting of the Memphis Horticultural Society. We're starting the year off with a, a little bit change of pace. Um, our, I'm really pleased to welcome our guest tonight, who is Robin Whitfield. She's a visual artist and naturalist in Grenada, Mississippi. She works in traditional watercolors and with pigment, pigments made from natural sources, such as plants and soils. Her studio is an old dry goods store in the historic downtown area, but much of her work is done on location about two blocks away in the Chakchima Swamp on the Yalawisha River. In 2018, she formed a nonprofit organization to bring visibility to this gem that's hidden in plain sight and to manage and conserve what is now the Lee Tart Nature Preserve. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Robin, and let you take hey, it away. thanks. All right. Well, thank y'all for having me. And I will, I have to admit to y'all, I feel a little extra nervous tonight. Uh, I, I guess I, I've gotten used to speaking in front of people, but I feel I, y'all, y'all may have to suffer with me a bit trying to figure out how to, how to show my presentation. So, um, but I really appreciate y'all having me here. And um, to me, the platform of being able to speak to people about my passion is meaning more and more to me as I feel a certain urgency about making sure people really see nature and connect to it. And I feel like when that I'm speaking to, perhaps preaching to the choir tonight, when I talk to plant people, I feel much more comfortable. I often find myself in front of a rotary club or something like that, which I love too, but I, I, sometimes I feel like when I go on about plants, I can see them tapping their fingers, or even if they're not literally doing it, possibly um, you know, in their mind. But what I would like to uh, show you all first um, is there's a little video clip that I think will sum up kind of what I do, who I am, and maybe even lead y'all to think of some questions that you would like to ask. And I may even show the video and then I have a presentation um, after that with some, some images from the Nature Preserve and some with my paintings and my process. Um, I may pause a little bit between Stephen, if you might kind of in between me kind of going from the video to the presentation, if y'all have questions, I may answer some questions, but if you ask me questions on the front end, I may even use some of your questions to guide uh, how I talk about um, during my presentation. Does that sound okay? Okay, so here I go. So this is a, just a, a little four or five minute section from Mississippi Roads that happened, they aired it just a few weeks ago. Yeah, we filmed it this spring, uh, right? Right. We had to kind of wait for COVID to get uh, kind of comfortable enough for us to meet and, and film this. All right. Let's see here. with my home life. For 35 years, my mother was an eighth grade art teacher. Since she had that perspective, a lot of our family vacations uh, revolved around going to art museums or in particularly what was so powerful to me was going to see Walter Anderson's home and work down in Ocean Springs. And of course, that was hugely powerful to me. I, I just grew up thinking that's what an artist was. Since that's, who, that's the artist I saw the most about, um, I just, I thought he represented artist and so that meant being outside in nature painting things you discovered and found and being isolated and on adventures all the time as an artist i almost always paint on location and occasionally i'll take a kayak what I love about kayaking is I can access things that no one else can access. I can take myself away from where I might get interrupted by a person or a sound and completely lose myself in nature. So over the years, I have tried to come up with a system that is lightweight, waterproof, rugged, and that has turned into a watercolor system. So I've, I've gotten to where I don't even take an easel these days. I take paint and I take paper. So an interesting thing happened uh, about a decade ago when I was painting. 
And uh, I was out in my kayak. I was out in the middle of a, of a swampy area uh, working on a painting that I was kind of excited about. And some wind came along and, and picked up my paper and blew it face down in the water. Well, I, I, with a heavy heart, I reached down to grab it. I, I just knew it was just going to be awful. And I picked it up, and sure enough, it was covered in this just brown stuff that was all over the water. And for a split second, I was a little disappointed. But I mean, I, I mean, pretty immediately, I, I almost took in my breath, like, oh my gosh. Because I, I, the color I was looking at, it, it was a pretty deep kind of translucent brown, almost a glowing orangey brown. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, that is the most beautiful color I've ever seen. And from that moment on, I, I started looking at the things around me in a new way. Because I, I, I mean, I've, I can't tell you how often I've, I've paddled through the swamp. I've gotten that brown, I guess some people call that swamp scum, but it's actually just plant oils. And that those plant oils also allow pollen to stick and dust to stick and all the, all the interesting stuff in the water rises to the surface. And so it's almost even like a Petri dish. I mean, it's as interesting to me scientifically as it is artistically. So when I pull my paper through that water, I can look down and see bits of plants, little animals moving around, sometimes algae, just all kinds of stuff. It's very seasonal, different times of year, different sorts of things will be in a very thin layer across the paper. And it's different every single time. And I, it never gets old. Now, I don't really know all the chemistry going on. I'm really more interested in the magic. For a long time, I, I thought my role as an artist was going to be like Walter Anderson. I was gonna paint images of certain areas and inspire people to go to those places or maybe to save a place. Well, <laughs> I am so glad that life had other plans for me. What's happened over the past 15 years is I've fallen in love with a particular natural area. Chakchuma Swamp at Leetart Nature Preserve is less than a quarter of a mile from our, our downtown square where my studio is located. So of course that means this is where I come the most and I come here almost every day. I first moved to Grenada in North Mississippi right out of college. I came here to paint murals. So when I wasn't painting murals, I just wandered around looking for a place to go. Well, I was living in our downtown at the time, and the closest natural area I could find was this big swamp. It was right over the river from our downtown. Well, this became my place. It became the place I came and began to really learn uh, about nature. Because like I was saying, I, I, I knew I loved nature all of my life, but I had not had an opportunity to spend a lot of time in one particular place. And I, I could not wait to get here every day. And it became the place I learned to watercolor. It became why I wanted to watercolor. It became where I put my first kayak into this swamp. Our city decided they wanted to do a citywide timber harvest on all their properties, the swamp being one of them. That's when the true conservationist in me came out, which I did not even truly realize was there at the extent that it was. Because I was not going to allow this place to be cut, or at least was going to give it my best shot at saving it. Because I thought to myself, if I can't save the one place I love in my backyard, then what can I save? This swamp happens to be in our downtown area. And everyone loves our downtown. And everyone loves this city. So I began to connect it to our downtown swamp. And the group of people who I had uh, also helping me, I think they were more connected to downtown than they were to the swamp. So that was very helpful. And when I approached the council and uh, approached them in a, in a way to have them see the place that they were going to cut as a place that they actually cared about, I don't think they had even noticed the swamp before. I began to just try to show them what it was they were going to cut and what they might lose and what they might lose for our community if they left this big hole in our downtown. Of course, I talked to them a little bit about the birds and the trees they might lose, but more importantly, I talked to them about the opportunities they would lose to connect people to a downtown swamp. I mean, who has a downtown swamp? They gave me an opportunity to bid on the trees and they gave me some time to gather money and I had this idea to sell the trees for their timber value. So I decided if trees were worth about 40 to $100, like most of the trees out here were, I felt like I could get most people to maybe adopt a tree. And I began to sell trees with the city's permission. And of course, they were simultaneously trying to bid off the trees too to real loggers. 
But in the end, uh, we had sort of a miracle happen. We had a philanthropist come up. And so he loaned us all the money to buy all the trees and we were the high bidder. So at that point, the city leased us the 300 acres and the man who loaned us the money requested that we name it a Lee Tart Nature Preserve. Everything is connected. The people coming here, they're loving it, them taking it back, talking about it, the way it spreads out into the world, every single thing is connected from the smallest microorganism here to the big groups of people that come here on our days when we do tours to just where it sits in our downtown. Every single thing is connected and everything that has happened here or will happen here is because of those connections. All right, here. All right. So, all right, Steve, you may have to help me here. Okay, stop sharing the screen. Okay, let me just see. What, okay, stop share. There you go. All right, cool. Okay, there y'all are. All right, cool. All right, so, um, I thought that would just give y'all a good basis for who I am and what I do uh, in the best way possible. So um, does anyone have any particular questions or thoughts before I move on to my presentation? Has anyone chatted, Steve? Um, there's, let's see, uh, just a round of applause so far, but okay. um, as you know, everybody should know that if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat box and we'll make sure they get answered before the end of the evening. Okay, cool. All right, with no further ado, I'll go on and um, I mean, I'm going to be here, Kat. I mean, I'm, I can answer questions through the presentation or wait till the end, uh, however y'all prefer. Um, I, I'm a person who during my, I kind of have an idea of how I want this to go, but if, if y'all have some questions or ways we could spend our time that you're interested in, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in shifting over towards y'all's thoughts as well or your, your ideas. So I'm going to go to share screen and uh, hang on. I don't see, uh, oh, I, I put it down here. Um, I'm sorry, y'all. Um, get back out of that and say share, there we are. Okay. All right, let's see here. I'm gonna say, all right, y'all, I'm gonna do my, the best I can figuring this out. Play side the show. All right, can y'all see me, Steve? You're good. All right, good. All right, so um, this presentation is basically a little bit about, um, it's an elaboration of kind of the little story I just told about how I've gone from being an artist who loves nature to a conservationist who wants to share nature through art and particularly color. So, um, I'm using uh, this kind of as a way to tell y'all, I started off by studying art at Delta State and there my professor, and I'm so glad I had him, Sammy Britt, he, uh, the first day of class, color is a language. That was basically what, what I learned from the time. I thought color was about painting or, or painting was really about, I didn't know what it was about when I entered college, but uh, I'm glad that this was drilled into my head because as I got out into the world, we used nature. We always had to paint from a life, from the landscape. And we were doing, we were in the Delta and we were generally doing like fields and, and things like that. But what I began to understand is that nature had colors that I could receive uh, through my eyes and I could translate that. And so I'm gonna show y'all a few shots of some work over the past couple of years and um, show y'all a little bit about how I'm now translating that color and what that means to me as an artist. And I've come to realize I'm also a poet. I'm more of a poetic painter. I like the idea that color can be used like a poet uses words, where um, I'm making rhymes and rhythms and um, trying to show vibrancy and aliveness. Possibly, I want it to feel a certain way almost more than uh, look exactly like something your eye would see. And so, but I let the, I let nature dictate to me its colors. Now it's hard to explain, but my, I see, what I see uh, is told to me by nature, but I'm kind of translating it in a poetic way. 
that probably made no sense. <laughs> so all of this is watercolor. You kind of saw a little bit of my process. We'll get a little bit more into my natural pigments through later on in this presentation. But this is my main uh, way of uh, really exploring um, form and composition. And this is also, I sell my watercolors where my natural pigments are generally me playing with ideas and connecting more directly with nature. So, um, so that was just a few images I wanted y'all to look at to kind of get a sense of, of um, and I, I can't help but notice these, these all, they're all trees and I didn't notice that I had chosen all trees until I made this presentation. But the truth is trees are about 80% of my subject. And uh, I'm not even seeing a tree. What I'm seeing generally is the life around that tree. As I sit still in the forest or I'm sitting here on the deck at a Lee Tart Nature Preserve, birds will get very close to me. For those of you who hunt or maybe you do photography uh, or even gardeners, if you're still, you know, if you're squatted down in, in, on your stool and you just get quiet, even for five minutes. Y'all know what I'm talking about when I say nature becomes alive around you. And I believe truly that that is why I paint. I paint so I can have that sort of intimacy with nature. And so color is my way to try to, it's that language that I can take in. All, there, I'm having sounds and I'm smelling and I'm hearing all sorts of things, but um, the eyes and, and that translation into color is where I'm having that deeper connection. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show y'all a few photographs that I've taken out at Lee Tart Nature Preserve to kind of make this point. Um, because what I find so interesting as an artist and what I like to share with others is that there are so many ways to see one thing. And so many times of year, even looking at that same one thing and every time it can be new and different. And that is why I continue to go out every day to the same place. So cypress trees are a huge part of uh, of what I see and love every day and really seek out. And we're gonna look at different facets of maybe not the exact same tree, but, but trees that are close together. And what I'm trying to show y'all is how I see as an artist and the kind of things my eye hones in on, the different colors and textures. This is a young cypress sprouting. One of the things I, uh, I learned, um, I was gonna mention to y'all because I thought some of y'all may have done this. I'm a master naturalist I, 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 in 2007. Um, I took the program through the Holly Springs, uh, the Strawberry Plains Audubon Center, and some of y'all may have also done the same. But through that program, I began to see a little bit more as a naturalist where I learned things like cypress only germinate um, once they, they can't germinate with water on top of them. And just learning little things like that make me notice things and then even be understanding about when I see something germinate that, that it couldn't have had water. Yeah, I realized the water had to have gone down for it to come up and makes me appreciate drought and things that happen, like the different, um, just the rhythm of the seasons. And I try to even notice that those are sort of sometimes my subjects in my paintings because I want to share that. Um, this presentation continues just to kind of go back to color because one of the things I also find interesting about color is that it helps me notice things. As an artist, I can't help my eye goes to something that's different. I have a feeling as gardeners, y'all are the same way. This is a strange little, um, this is a type of gall. And I, I, I know I've looked up what this is, but cypress trees often have, lots of plants have galls. I'm sure as gardeners, y'all see that as well. And galls have become particularly fascinating to me over the years because they're a relationship between an insect and a plant. And sometimes a fungus and a plant, but, um, but you know that that plant has grown by force uh, something to uh, that that plant uh, I mean that insect needs generally a nursery, um, and so and this is another little series I'm going to show you all about how color and contrast works for me. I see uh, these uh, snowy and great egrets all the time when I'm out kayaking, and their stark white forms, kind of the absence of color, really make the richness of color of everything else uh, really jump out. I did this painting on location a couple years ago. Um, one of my favorite views of, of egrets are when they're all clustering on the cypress trees in, in the twilight. And I had like about literally five minutes to do that painting because it was almost dark and the, and the egrets were coming in to roost. And I just wanted to capture that as quickly and simply as I could. And so I think I was painting in the dark on that. Uh, but, but considering I, I captured something that I was after uh, when I was doing that. And this is me just playing in the studio with some of those ideas of color that I capture when I'm outside and I store inside myself. 
And one more little example, I think this is my last example of sort of a, a, a of color draw, drawing me in and then me noticing um, how nature itself does the same. So we're, of course, we're looking at aquatic milkweed. Um, I think that's uh, Asclepius perennis. We, this is a, a plant that grows in some of the ditches that are surrounding Lee Tart Nature Preserve. And it's just so delightful. I was walking along this ditch that I actually never thought to look in. I mean, who, who thinks to look in a ditch? But uh, one spring day, I was just wandering around. Uh, this pink caught my eye. I went down there and I, and, and I did not know that this, this milkweed was down there. And then I began, my eye began to see yellow and the black, white, and yellow. And I began to realize that almost every single plant, and it was about a hundred of them, had a caterpillar of different size, you know, some huge like this one and some smaller ones, each one on a stalk. Uh, now I noticed and I started looking more closely and I realized that um, there were also some chrysalis already in there. And this, this is a shot from maybe that same day. Um, I, I came back the next, the next day was Sunday and I'll say sometimes this is church for me and my priest completely understands. I told, told him sometimes I just feel like I have to do uh, this sort of thing on a Sunday morning. I went and got my stool and went back early that next day and spent the morning out painting um, the milkweed. And uh, often what I'm looking for is not necessarily a literal translation. I have my camera for that, but like once again, the poetics something that, 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 that the rhythm and the textures and the things that, that caught my eye to begin with. Um, so what I want y'all to see in this is, so what I see, what I'm showing y'all here is a caterpillar and some milkweeds or my kind of abstract interpretation. But just going back to the idea of color, um, just to help y'all with this, this is kind of my last slide of talking to y'all about an artist uh, or color as an artist for me. We're gonna move on into uh, more of a naturalist uh, thoughts in a minute. But up close, I hope that this actually ceases to be a caterpillar. What I want y'all to see when I'm painting, I'm not even thinking caterpillar. I'm not thinking milkweed. I try to open myself completely to where I'm only seeing color and rhythm and pattern. And in that way, I believe that, I, uh, that, that nature itself kind of speaks to me in, in a language all its own. And so this is kind of showing you what I'm seeing as I'm painting versus seeing a caterpillar. Of course, when I'm done, I kind of want it to feel like a caterpillar, but, uh, uh, you know, when it doesn't feel right, I know it's not a good painting. So this is kind of back to that, this, this idea that I just said, over the years in painting in nature, directly from nature, this is what I fully believe. I think color is a primal language of nature, and I think all gardeners would agree. Um, so this is a common plant, jewelweed, at Lee Tart Nature Preserve. Uh, this is also a common plant in Grenada, and we have a little bit at Lee Tart Nature Preserve. This is red buckeye. Now, y'all may not, y'all may can already guess where I'm going with this, but 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 this, the, both of those plants are are are, are speaking uh, even at this time of year. There there's a reason they're the color that they are, and there's a reason that they um, are, are are blooming this color when they are. They are advertising. These are billboards. Okay, and of course there's plenty of insects who will take full advantage and here's another one. But this guy, those plants are, are speaking, they're using color to speak, to, to, to say to another species, hey, come over here. So what I, as an artist, these are the sorts of things that, that I, I love the naturalist course because it helped me know what I'm looking at. I, I might look at something like this for two hours as I'm painting it and I begin to notice its structure. And what I've, you know, I've painted this plant many times and only recently realized uh, the little, you know, this is perfectly suited for the, um, the hummingbird to put, dip its head into the tube of that flower. And while doing that, uh, it, it, you know, the plant is, is pulling the bird over there to pollinate it. It's getting the pollen on with, from the little white fuzzy thing and then it goes to the next flower and it's pollinating. And that's, that just blows my mind. And so I have, um, also realize that this, this plant grows in my backyard. This is trumpet creeper. And I get to watch this in action all the time with the bumblebees and the hummingbirds both. And it is uniquely designed for both of those species. Only those species can utilize it properly and pollinate it at the same time. So sometimes my painting, my quick abstract painting style does not uh, allow me to do what I want. So over the past couple of years, I've been doing an illustration series um, about the plant and uh, animal insect relationships that I see. And this is one example. And I used um, natural pigments for this. I used poke, 
pokeweed leaves and red dirt and uh, sunflower petals to make the colors oh, and, and a charcoal to, uh, to, to exclusively, you know, to, I, I use no paint. I simply found wild pigments. Um, so <clears throat> here's another just little vignette. Uh, the aquatic life is, you know, the kayaker in me uh, has me really close to the surface. And I think for years before I got a kayak, I just stall stuff on the surface, kind of like I was talking about the, the swamp scum that I did not understand was a beautiful color and was just the oils of plants. So this is mosquito fern. I think a lot of people just, I thought, I assumed that was dead vegetation. Uh, you can usually see it here in the winter. Um, if, you're, if you're passing a wetland, you may see big burgundy floating areas. It's the smallest aquatic fern. Here's a close-up of it. It's mixed in with the duckweed here. And, uh, and of course, duckweed is the smallest vascular plant. It has a microscopic flowers in the summer. And then this is the, you know, the smallest fern uh, in the world. And they say it's called mosquito fern, by the way. I just find this interesting because they say uh, it, when it grows across the surface like that, it prevents mosquitoes from um, laying their eggs. So, hey, that's all right with me. So here we are kind of a close up of that, uh, that what were, you know, the, the uh, oily surface of the swamp from all the decaying mat, the decaying leaves, particularly cypress. And here's a little bit closer example of uh, what y'all saw in the film uh, earlier. And I have learned to manipulate that if you put water on the paper prior to dipping it into the water, it will, ma it will leave the white areas. So I've had a lot of fun playing uh, with that. But I kind of like it raw. I try not to manipulate too much and just enjoy the process of, of looking at what I pull up. And here I am in my kayak. I can, I can do this for hours. And uh, often they just end up in drawers in my studio, but a lot of them will end up in collages that I cut up. So here's another little forest floor vignette, another favorite place to just sit. I'm with my buddy Joseph, and he's teaching me about mushrooms in this picture and giving me the confidence to actually to pick these chanterelles. And I went home later that very evening and, and ate them. Uh, it was my first wild mushroom experience. But what I love about mushrooms and color is, first of all, they're advertising too. On the forest floor, they're, such, they're the brightest forms on the floor. And, uh, you know, they're calling to all sorts of animals who can eat them, and, and I'm one of them. But they're for their colors. Um, I, I love to play with mushrooms. You know, this is me uh, rubbing the mushroom. That upper left-hand color is me pushing the uh, the mushroom onto the paper uh, just to see what color it is. And that's a lot of my sketchbooks look just like this. In fact, this is a page in my sketchbook. And this is me later playing with collage, where I'm cutting and layering papers, where I've got some of these uh, mud rubbed on the paper on the bottom, and there's watercolor showing through. I've, I like to cut out holes and show layers. So these are those chanterelle forms that uh, I'm showing there. Um, just the, I just y'all, I just have so many cool pictures of mushrooms. These are just kind of showing y'all some cool colors and and the things that draw my attention as I walk through the forest floor. Oh, another I forgot I did a collage on this. Yeah. So this was inspired by that Russula mushroom with the, with the circles. And then I rubbed some mushrooms on that paper also for, um, for that collage. I often don't sell the works I do that involve plant pigments because they do change over time. But I've had people in, in buy them because of that. They wanna watch it change. So, so here's just another a straight up watercolor of some of the mushrooms I see. And, Actually, I couldn't believe I captured that butterfly. It flew by right as I was painting that section. So I left a little butterfly shaped hole so I could paint him in. Uh, this is the um, this American Caesar's mushroom. I call this hatching out of its egg, but this, is, this one comes out of this white kind of, it, it's enveloped in this little white casing and they pop out. And so this is who um, I, that's, this is who I mostly see eating the mushrooms when I'm in the forest floor and who I, I'm saying the color is for. I, I don't know how well they see, but I'm going to guess much, I mean, that box turtles see in color because they're always chomping on all those colorful mushrooms. So I think this is the last little vignette to show y'all maybe before the, the next sec segment about my um, uh, nonprofit work. So <clears throat> Once again, this is a little story that um, I'm starting this time with the actual image I made of my story. So here we have an eastern screech owl, and I don't know if y'all recognize this. This is woolly pipe vine, and then we have our pipe vine swallowtails. Uh, he's you know poking his head out of the cypress uh, tree there, and this is one of the most common vines at Lee Tart Nature Preserve. It's growing all over the riverbank and along the forest, and it's uh, one of our native. I'm sure y'all have it up in, in Memphis, but it's just I, I, I never. Never. I, I found the uh, flower by accident one day. I was kind of 
underneath the vines and I had never seen such, never heard of this plant. And I was just captivated because it's so foreign looking and come to find this is its leaf. Um, and this is me on a riverbank having done a leaf print and then use the mud on, uh, from the riverbank to uh, capture this. And then um, this is the pipe vine swallowtail that is the, uh, the pipe vine of course is the host for this caterpillar. And this of course is the adult. And I find them a good bit because I mean, they've got their, their host plant everywhere. Um, now this one, I, I can't remember why I threw this in there, y'all. As I was looking at my presentation earlier, I think some, some of these things, I just, the color combinations were just so fascinating to me. Orange is one of those things. I think this looks like a butterfly to me. This is of course yellow poplar flowers. It's in the magnolia family. And uh, I find them on the forest floor after a storm because otherwise they're way up in the canopy. But there's just something about this combo. Um, I can't help but think they're attracting some sort of pollinator there. Um, <clears throat> And then this is going to be kind of a segue to um, my nonprofit work. This is the Prothonotary Warbler. And if you've never seen one, all you need to do is go along the Wolf River in Memphis or, def or come on down to Lee Tart Nature Preserve. We'd love for you to come visit. We're about an hour and a half away from y'all, uh, south, if you've never been to Grenada. But this is our little mascot. Um, uh, it's the only cavity dwelling warbler. Most warblers, of course, build nests, but this one requires a, a hole in a tree and it cannot make its own hole. It has to have one already excavated by a woodpecker or maybe a rotten limb that's fallen off. And it needs to find one that is not already occupied by a wood duck or a squirrel or a woodpecker or somebody else. So they're considered a threatened species, but because we have a swamp with a lot of dying trees, which, and I mean that in a good way, we have a lot of this guy, but their little bright color is unmistakable. You're gonna see him flitting around where you might not see all the little brown birds that are, that are um, also everywhere. And here's my interpretation of that using uh, dirt, poke berries. I'm a big fan of, uh, of um, poke salad is what I call it. And I know a lot of people consider that a weed. And when I went to Europe a few years ago, I was so charmed and also disturbed that everyone was planting our American pokeweed in their gardens because it's an I think it's become invasive over there. But I'm a big lover of it in my own garden. But I use the berries uh, in my artwork. So that's what the little pinkish purple color in this is, is what I've been using as well as I think I used the uh, dayflower for the blue in this one. And I think I used bitterweed for the yellow in this one. I'm almost sure. <clears throat> So, um, so, what I, so what I'm going to shift to now is, so with all of this really focus on color in my life, whether it's watching nature or as a painter, I have uh, found that for me, it is the best way I have, or I know personally, to try to connect other people to nature. Because I believe it, it I, I can connect people to your, your I can, everyone can see color and can notice it and um, can relate to the fact that it's it's meaningful to them and then I can help them understand that that's how nature communicates back to them and other creatures and so um, we do a lot my organization's mission is uh, uh, to um, conservation through creativity curiosity and connection is our formal um, uh, uh, mission statement and we are I think I'm going to get to maybe our, our, our logo in a minute but um, we just like to get people directly coming in contact with nature in some way. And I found that um, art classes, and, and I'm using art in a broad context, um, where we are getting people to touch things, rub colors on the paper, to photograph things. Here, I love to hand people loops where we look at things closely. We're looking at, this is called the, the I think, deer vomit. Uh, I think it's called deer vomit actually, it's a slime mold and it should be on, uh, it, it grows exclusively on muscadine vines. So it's safety orange. It looks like someone came in and spray painted in the forest and it will get your attention from a long way away. <clears throat> and I, it's curious to me why it's that color and I have not solved that mystery yet, but I know it's bright color must have a purpose. So here I here we are with uh, with someone who's come out to the swamp and they're tiddling around with some colors that they found. And what I like about that particular activity is without any words, without any even formal skills as an artist, everyone is very anxious to pick up berries and pick up leaves and pick up flower petals and dirt and mushrooms and just explore 
and I think kind of interact and kind of almost have, I would call it a dialogue with that subject through the color itself. And, and may, you know, of course you smell it too. You smell the fungus or the, or the bright uh, peppery smells of different leaves or, or, um, or certainly berries. Here we have some Girl Scouts doing this in mass. I handed them all paint brushes and gave them permission to paint with mud. And most of them threw the paint brushes down and just used their hands. Uh, but this is something you can just do with all ages. And so I've just found this is just a way to get everyone unintimidated uh, when it comes to nature is just invite them to explore color. So here are some different soils that I had some kids. We all went and tried to find as many different colors as we could on one location. And so this was, you can find much brighter colors in, in different locations, but I thought we did pretty good considering we were in a, in a, I can't remember, I think we were at the swamp on this one. And here I have a, a, a group of uh, teenagers where we, I rolled out a giant piece of uh, watercolor paper and we had gone uh, collecting earlier that day and found just some red clay, good old red clay and ground it down into a powder and just, we ended up making a big mural with this. And, but this was the beginning stages and we had a blast at that phase. So a lot of the kids when we're doing more like uh, journaling, you know, a lot, this particular girl wanted to know everyone and label it and how to spell it. And I'm not always good at the spelling myself. I thought she did pretty darn good. She was like a fourth grader. Here's the day flower that I was speaking of earlier. And we have an invasive, uh, or we have an exotic species and a native species, and they look very, very similar. And I'm not even sure, I think this is the Asian species, Asian day flower, but it's just one of the nicest blues that you can find in the wild and makes a terrific color on paper. And that, 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 that's not really doing it justice actually, but you can see the color down there at the bottom. I use it a lot in my, um, in my, my illustrations. And so you can see here's the black eyed Susan and the color it makes on the paper. And here I am, uh, you know, you'd think all these different blackberry, the stages of the blackberries would offer all these different colors, but they're always just purpley pink. But that's fine with me because they're, it's, it's a beautiful color. And of course my favorite, the, the, the poke berry here. And uh, these are elderberries that I have a, the, a, a, also a group of teenagers mushing into an ink for us. And I tell you, it's just so fun to work with natural pigments. And I, I would encourage you all to maybe try something like this yourself in your own garden with plants. Maybe you've never, maybe you've known them all your life, but you can have a whole new conversation with them now and, and know them in a different way. All right. Okay. My presentation has stopped. Hang on. Steve, can you hear me? Yeah, sounds like you're playing the bongos. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, why it won't go forward. Um, can you think of a reason? There's at least, there's about 10 more slides on here. Can I, I'm gonna show, maybe I can escape from this and look at the overall presentation and make sure they're there. Yeah, you can, uh, you can stop sharing your screen for a moment and do that if you want. Okay, I apologize y'all. Hold it. Uh, let me come up here. Uh, oh, here it goes. It was just being slow. Okay. Um, here we go. <laughs> so here's just some more playing where um, I, I, I'm showing y'all a little bit of this. I'm really hoping I might get y'all wanting to go home and try this yourself. So um, this is this is elderberries and poke berries and some white clay. And I laid down some, I wanna say maybe periwinkle flowers. I can't remember. I laid them down in the ink as it dried. And when I picked, after it was all dry, I lifted those flowers up and it left that impression. But you can just have, so, there's no rules with, there's no rules ever in art anyway, but I promise you when you're working with mud and berry juice and you can get blueberries and strawberries in your kitchen and play around. But this is just one more little fun thing that's about color. That I, that I guess has is, is gotten me really interested in chemistry and I can't help but mention. So I took some pansy petals, put them on a piece of watercolor paper and then took white clay, really wet white clay and brushed across it. And this, this happened, this immediate reaction, these green colors came out. And I felt certain something about pH happened with that probably very alkaline clay and probably the very acidic or you know, the tannic acids or whatever in plants. But anyway, this has given me kind of a whole new playing around with, with uh, those um, acid and bases kind of thing. And I'm just at the beginning, this happened this, this spring. 
But um, this is just fun for me. And these give me new ways of understanding the plants in my life. So what I wanna do here is just brief, and this is gonna be the, probably the briefest part of the presentation, but y'all may have questions to ask me more about this. And y'all can go to our website and even follow us on Facebook to kind of see what all we're about. And we're, we're very active online. So Leetard Nature Preserve, like y'all heard was named, this used to be called Chopchuma Swamp Natural Area. And our, our uh, philanthropist wanted it named after a man in our town who had, who had died the same year they were gonna cut the swamp. And we're very fortunate to have his name now attached to us because he was kind of a local hero that, that was killed, trying to save a little girl in a hostage situation. Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to start with this logo to kind of tell you, we spent about a year designing this logo because what's so important to me about uh, people understanding that Lee Tart Nature Preserve is not uh, just a normal uh, delta swamp. We're very close to the delta, but we're sort of a North Mississippi hill swamp where we have multiple types of habitats that include some ridges and hill type environments. So this logo represents the water and you know the different hill structures and uh, the different layers of like our understory and shrub layers and overstory um, of our forest. Um, and I couldn't help but want to show you all this aerial before we drop down into Lee Tart Nature Preserve because I went to school in the Delta and spend a lot of time in the Mississippi Delta. And y'all see where Grenada is over on the right hand side. I'm extremely aware of the losses in wetlands. And uh, if y'all don't know, we have about 1% left of what we would just call natural wild uh, 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 bottomland forest. Uh, and what's even more, I've never really just considered this until recently, but um, really we'll probably never have these oxbows again, not unless we all decide we're willing to let the Mississippi River and all of our other river levees burst. So um, all of these little oxbows y'all see in the Delta, which is basically everywhere there's not a field, we have those, it's not as easy to see in Lee Tart Nature Preserve, but that's what the rivers left as they danced across uh, the, the, the um, you know, just, I think your rivers is dancing and just as they decide to shift with each flood, they, they would leave these scars on the land, these lakes. And we will not have that again. So what we have now is all we will have, um, which makes it extra special that we have this little oxbow area in our downtown. So here we are looking right above Lee Tart Nature Preserve and you can see our downtown right below it. So I'm hoping this may encourage y'all to come down and visit. I, come down to our little coffee shop, come visit me in my studio. And then you can just come right, you know, you can bring your kayak or not. We've got uh, over a mile of hiking trails as well. Y'all can see Grenada Lake is within a mile of, of the nature preserve as well. And one of the things that also makes it so great for birding and for plants is you see we're not surrounded by neighborhoods, that we are encapsulated by hunting clubs, other public lands and, um, Really the, the whole river corridor all the way to the Delta is uh, very wild and green. So we have a whole, you know, we have a, a, a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, we have a very wild area here and this is the public access. So this is me standing on our main street, looking out across uh, one of our oxbows. And we have several kayaks that we let people use whenever they would like. So I, I extend that to you all as well. If you don't have your own kayak, but would like to come down, we have about five kayaks, maybe six. Um, I, I mean, we might could have more, but we would love to have y'all come down and, and use them whenever you like. So we also have uh, three different trail systems. Uh, this one, this North Trail is like kind of our wilder trail and probably the trail I spend most of my time on. It's a big bottom land overlooking probably our wilder oxbow. And uh, y'all, most of the pictures that I've been showing y'all came off of it. Oh, I didn't know this was a video. Hang on. I don't know. Hang on. Okay. Um, and so I wanted to actually show y'all sort of, once you step inside that trail or most of our trails, really you're looking up at this towering canopy and it stays pretty dark there in the summer, which is wonderful. But um, as you, I don't know if y'all can see the little tag that's on this particular tree. This is one of our, we've tagged 600 trees, which we adopt to people. We've adopted about 300 of those 600, um, still trying to pay off our, our loan for the trees. But um, I find, I can't, I, when I look at this and I realize it could have been cut, it's still, um, it just, it, it hits me in the gut sometimes because I know these trees as individuals because I've been going, coming to this area for over 25 years. 
And uh, this is a painting I did actually during that scary time where we weren't sure we were going to win. We, we did not know how we were going to pull off buying all these trees. And I remember sitting there in that moment and painting this. And this painting ended up becoming uh, sort of, uh, it, it, we ended up putting it into print and giving it to everyone who adopted a tree from us. And we, we still do that. Here's one of our forestry students who we got, we, we um, partnered with our local community college's forestry program and had the students go out and cruise the forest as if they would, you know, be cruising it to cut it. But of course they were cruising it to save it. So we, they, they did all the tagging of the trees. Here they are. And uh, they've continued to actually work with us over the years. And actually here's kind of a close up of, of one of our trees. So the good, the good news is after the city got on board and we were able to, um, we, we weren't so friendly in the beginning, I will tell y'all, but once we were able to move past the hump of all they really needed was some money and we were able to give that to them, they were very proud of this project and are very thankful that it happened this way. And we went on to win an award uh, for the Mississippi Municipal League for, for having this citizen uh, driven um, project that helped our town stay beautiful, connect citizens to something meaningful, and then also give the city a destination. So here's the little, uh, here's the actual name of my organization, Friends of Chakchiuma Swamp. The Chakchiuma, if y'all are wondering, were the native peoples of our area, and it means red crawfish people. And so we decided to take on that particular name, um, the swamp used to be called Dump Lake. And so we just renamed Dump Lake to Chakchuma Swamp based on um, some input from our historical society. And we wanted to give a, a, a nod to the historical, to the relation, the human relationship there that was, um, you know, predated uh, our, our time in Grenada, I mean, predated Grenada. And we chose the Pathanitary Warbler because of its specialness and uniqueness to uh, wetlands. And of course it's threatened status, which kind of, um, indicates, I guess, our, our concern about protecting this area and hoping people realize its specialness. So our, our main focus is our conservation, community, and connection. And um, I have a great team, a great board. We've got a group of educators that um, we give every last Saturday, we give a public hike in the morning. We do lots of hands-on workshops and um, maybe events in the, let me see, I think I, this is our nighttime event called Nature at Night. We uh, work with the um, Mississippi Bat Working Group. They miss net uh, and let the public uh, see what they can. This is a dead bat, by the way, if y'all are freaking out because you, 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 this is not how you handle live bats. I just love that little boy. We also do lots of field trips. This is a high school um, that came up from Jackson and they spent the whole day with us and we had Fish and Wildlife Service come out and do the science end and I did the art end. That's something we do a lot. Uh, we, we try to balance things with science and art. Um, we hire a lot of artists. I know so many artists. So this year we hired this particular sculptor to come out and he sculpted faces on about uh, 30 trees. And we did a big Halloween event that invited people to walk down our trails at night where these trees were lit up with lights. And uh, that was a whole, we, we attracted over 300 people and we had a whole lot of fun because this was something safe we could do during COVID. And uh, we've been, a, we've had probably more interest this year than we have probably ever. We've only been a, an organization for three years, but we've had a whole lot of interest this year because I think people feel safe uh, to be together um, outside on a trail. And this is just another, I, I threw this in just, uh, kind of as an afterthought, because I did this yesterday, but I was, uh, or day before yesterday, I found these iris leaves, and I knew as gardeners, uh, y'all, I only recently, one of the workshops we did this year, let me, get, let me start there, we uh, gave a cordage workshop, learning how to make cordage from uh, plant fibers, and that's something I had never done, this is a new skill for me, and so I now see iris leaves in a whole new way. We have copper iris growing wild at, um, at Lee Tart Nature Reserve, and I happened to found a patch that I did not know existed and they were just in kind of this decaying state which is perfect for cordage. So I sat there for about 15 minutes and had a very quiet little meditation of making uh, copper iris cordage. So um, anyway, uh, you may, we, 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 are, we hope to do this uh, particular workshop again this year. We had a huge, we, we had to cut it off at 12 or maybe 10. We were trying to stay within our city's guidelines, but um, it was so popular. I feel certain we'll do it again if, if anyone's interested in coming down. Another interesting project we did this year, we partnered with a quilt making artist 
And we chose 24 plants and animals that live at the swamp and invited the community to three public workshops. This was prior to COVID. We did this last January where they selected fabrics to interpret different animals and plants. And we ended up, the artist ended up having to finish it by herself after, you know, restrictions came on. But um, it's, it's, we, we originally decided to make quilts so we could lay them on the ground for our field trips and have kids sit. They would each take, you know, learn a little bit about the square they're sitting on. And so I, I envision us using them still on field trips, but I'm so in love with them. I'm not sure I can bear to put them on the ground for a while. But we used uh, recycled khaki pants for the backs and, and all the sides. So, you know, it should be pretty rugged. We have, um, we have four of them. And here's my board, this is the team here in front of our sign. This, you'll see this sign when you pull up and park and um, there's a, there are maps on the back and you can see where to go. And so here's my little cartoon map, but we have, we have much more specific maps that you can also access on our website. So um, anyway, uh, I'm gonna take questions in a minute. Uh, everything is connected is our kind of, it's becoming our official motto. It kind of became, it was our unofficial motto for Lee Tart Nature Preserve, I guess because of all the interesting connections that came about to make everything possible that we now are doing. But I can tell you right now, just from, I'm sure y'all can see from my presentation, from the video, um, my life as an artist and my life in nature has really, and is continuing to teach me that everything is connected. And I, that's the, one of the most exciting things I could ever think about. And I, I certainly wanna share that kind of enthusiasm. So y'all can see um, our website there at the bottom. If anybody wants to um, go check us out a little deeper and uh, y'all can see how to spell Chuma if you wanna check us out on Facebook. Um, I think that's it, Steve. Um, are there, do we have any questions or? Yeah, there's several questions. Um, and because your uh, presentation had several phases to it, they're kind of all over the place. That's fine. I'm gonna try to work backwards here. Um, just a little bit of clarification about the, the uh, Lee Tarp Preserve. Actually, who owns the land? What keeps it protected? All that good stuff. Okay. I didn't know how much to, to say about that, but yeah. So the, the city of Grenada still owns the, the, the 300 acres and um, we have a 60 year lease on it, which uh, we don't know what's gonna happen at the end of those 60 years, but I'll, it probably won't be me, I'll probably be dead. So, <laughs> um, but uh, so we, that, that's our relationship is we have complete, um, all, we have all men, but basically they just own it. We, have, we get to make all decisions uh, uh, about what happens to it and on it and, um, and we are actually still trying to figure out what that is. We didn't mean to become a nonprofit. I, you know, we, we, I did not understand this is how this would play out. I thought I'd find a nice little conservation easement and, and uh, let somebody else handle this who knew what they were doing. But as, um, as things, as the universe willed it, 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 it felt to me. And like I was saying in the video, I'm, I, I'm very thankful. Uh, I was terrified in the beginning, but now I realize that um, not knowing is okay. And we're still trying to figure out, you know, exactly how all this works. But the city is very grateful for us to be um, taking, making use of something. Before we took over, there was no, we have a gate up. When you come, you will see a, a gated area that you have to walk behind. Because the, you, you know, before we put the gate up, you could just drive onto this property it's called Dump Lake because people would just dump whatever they wanted to out there and, and people fished and dumped and rode, rode their mud trucks. It's got an area that's extremely compromised, maybe about 10 acres, but the majority of it uh, is, is not compromised at that level. And since we've put our gate up and cleaned things up, it is certainly not having that vibe anymore. We have hired a landscape architect out of Jackson known as Native Habitats. And our idea, we hired them two years ago and we were doing this long kind of slow process of figuring out a master plan with them. And it's helping us kind of figure out who we are as well. And, it, and they're getting to know the property, we're getting to know the property better as a group. And so we're hoping that the most compromised area where the mud trucks used to ride and people used to dump is gonna become our main interpretive area where we will design that 10 acres to um, really interpret the entire 300 acres on that one, you know, in a very, very succinct, small distilled area. Uh, we'll probably, you know, mimic or, or plant some habitats. Uh, the, the architect where you, the landscape architect we're uh, working with uh, 
He's been very involved with Crosby Arboretum, if anyone's familiar with that. And so he's very much taking that approach of letting it be a dynamic sort of uh, ideas of interpreting a wetland, but trying to show the four or five different habitats that Grenada has to offer and that property has to offer. So we're, we're excited to watch it unfold. And it's become, this year with COVID, it's given us a lot more time to actually work together outside. And it's becoming very exciting finally because we're beginning to see a little bit more about we want, what we want this to be. But I envision it's gonna be several more years of kind of slow thinking. I'm now realizing how, what a slow process this is. Um, anyway, I think I've probably gone on too long about that, but um, uh, is there any other question kind of related to that? No, um, we did have uh, kind of still back at this back end. Yeah. Uh, so if folks want to know when, when you're going to be available in your studio or when they can come borrow a kayak or come yeah. practice painting with natural pigments, uh, how, what's the best way for them to find out what you're up to and if you're available? Okay, probably the best way is um, all of our contact info is on our website. I think my own phone, my personal phone, you basically you call me or, or you email me. I'm the person on the other end generally. And I even have my own phone number just on our gate. If you just drive up at the gate and you forgot to look it up, my phone number is on the gate and you can just call me. But if you send me an email ahead of time, I can even make sure that gate is open for you already. And, or if you wanna come by my studio, my studio, I typically try to keep it open on Fridays anyway, but if you arrange with me, I can be in my studio whenever uh, someone would like to come if I'm available, because I try to be out in the swamp mostly. I don't like to be stuck inside. So, um, but I do try to keep some hours, but that, you know, so, but Facebook Messenger is a great way too. That's, that probably gets the most instant response of all, so. Um, you can follow Robin Whitfield, uh, per, me personally on Facebook, or go to Friends of Chachuma Swamp and follow us as well, or both. Okay, and I don't think you've told us your your uh, actual um, website. Uh, my 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 personal website. Yeah. My personal website is robinwhitfield.com. I'm pretty okay. easy. And okay. the, the Friends of CS.org is the. You know, I didn't want to make people spell Chachuma, so right. down at the bottom is our organization's. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm just robinwhitfield.com. Okay. Several questions about your art specifically. Um, do you have anybody who represents you up here in Memphis? Is there someplace people can go see your art up here? Oh, well, yeah, the only, I only have one representation and that's in Tupelo and that is, uh, Karen Gallery in Tupelo represents me. Okay. But we can see your stuff in your, in your studio and also uh -huh. see, uh, the swamp and everything else if we come down. That's right. Exactly. And, um, and just, I'm just putting this out there. I do, I, I actually don't like being in galleries. Uh, I'm, I finally, I, I've only been in the gallery in Tupelo a couple of years. I like having my work free to take on the road. Cause if y'all can't tell, I love to share nature with people. So my passion is how I like access to my own paintings at all times where I can go show at a museum or go to an event like the Hummingbird Festival at Strawberry Plains Audubon Center or I've never been to Leichterman Nature Center, but I keep thinking that'd be a good connection to show my work. I like to show my work in places where it helps make connections with people interpreting uh, uh, nature. Great. Um, some just a lot of complimentary comments. People enjoy your colors and, and your, your work. And one person, you had mentioned Walter Anderson. Someone said they like your, your stuff better. <laughs> um, also, um, somebody mentioned that the, uh, some of the work that you did was more figurative. Some of the birds and things would be ideal for a child, a children's book or something. Mm -hmm. If you've ever thought about doing that. Oh, yeah. I've got a lot of books. Uh, I'd like to, um, I, I need time. If someone can tell me how to find a big pot, I don't want gold at the end of the rainbow. I want a big pot of time that I can have yeah. just for me where no one interrupts me for like maybe a year or two. <laughs> and I can just sit in a cabin in the woods and, and do what I want. Does anybody else want that? Yeah. But yeah, I, I actually, I do have some children's books that I, I'm going to call them children for children of all ages, but where they're right. very pictorially taking people through a, um, maybe some, some outdoor adventures. And uh, I envision maybe that happening over the next four or five years that, that the swamp having to be saved kind of derailed me for a while or derailed me from some projects I already had going in my mind. But now that I've now that I'm in deep on this conservation project, that's only added into it, and so I'm grateful that a lot of my ideas have have gotten much deeper for what I was going to do. So, yeah. 
um, somebody so that they first be they first discovered you through a book of Eudora Welty illustrated oh. uh, quotes about plants. Yeah, and wanted to know more about how that project came together and uh, how you became involved with that. Yeah, that's cool that, that someone's seen that book. Um, I, I didn't know how far it had traveled. But I'm gonna tell you what, that was one of the most exciting things that happened to me as a young artist. Um, this was back, uh, Patty Carr Black is um, who is, the, is, is a longtime friend of Eudora Welty and who uh, put that book together. And uh, if, uh, I, know her, I knew her as being the foremost art historian of our state. She wrote a book called Art in Mississippi. Just a super cool person. So one day I get an, an, like, an old, like a snail mail letter. This is back before really the internet. Uh, this is, gosh, maybe 2004, five, or at least before I was using the internet. Um, I get a letter in the mail and it's from Patty Carr Black asking me if I would be interested in, in illustrating a book that, that is about, um, it was going to focus on quotes from Eudora Welty that focus on um, things in nature. And I mean, I, I was probably, how, 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 I don't know how old I was then, but I was barely in my, maybe my late twenties. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, and I was basically nobody, but I, I mean, I know lots of people. Mississippi is a pretty small, but people make fun of Mississippi as being like just one big, like one, one kind of big town. And so I, I already had a reputation of, of being someone who wanted to be in nature drawing and painting. And I knew someone else, you know, just is who you know, right? And so they had suggested this young artist in Grenada um, be the illustrator because they, they were looking for a female watercolor painter who had a connection to nature. And so I happened to be that description. And so I was very fortunate though, because that book kind of got me, yeah, it got me a, the attention of um, people who enjoyed poetry and art and nature and all those things that, um, that, 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 I, you know, that I love. And so that helped me get, get some shows and some, I, I was a very, I'm extremely shy, but I was super shy then. And so that kind of allowed me to, that opened some doors that I think could not have been opened otherwise. And gave me a, I had honestly never read Eudora Welty up to that point. And, and when I had to, to do the, uh, the book, I didn't realize she was a painter with words and I became pretty fascinated with her from that point on. Great. Um, the, uh, with the warbler being the uh, mascot for the Friends organization, is it resident there all year long or is it uh, seasonal or what's the story with that? That's, that's, a, that's a good question because I'm going to tell you, all, I, I was until I really started coming to the swamp and spending every day and I didn't know anything about birds. I knew more plants than birds and I didn't know that many plants back 25 years ago. You know, I, I noticed that I didn't notice all these colorful birds as much in the winter or maybe you know, I just, it took me a long time to kind of realize. Well, I finally realized in that master naturalist course that there are some, there are bird, there's a group of birds called neotropical migrants and the prothonotary warbler is one of them. And when people say birds migrate, that's, that's so vague. So let me just tell you, this is so, this is just so fascinating to me. So in the, in the, um, this time of year in the winter, the prothonotary warbler if you were to go visit um, some place in Mexico, maybe in the mountains, or you go to Costa Rica, Central America, or Cuba, you're, you might see this exact bird that I showed y'all in that picture earlier. They're spending their winter. They might, our neotropical migrants spend their winters down in the tropics, but they come to the deep south, um, uh, or actually or really just all of North America. The Prothonte warbler is more attracted to the deep south to, uh, to uh, I guess, to breed. So we, you know, <clears throat> they will build their nest here, have their babies, and when their babies are old enough to fly, it's getting about September and they head back south again for, they're looking for food. They need caterpillars. That's their diet. And so one of the things I also learned uh, during my Master Naturals course and was I had no idea what, what you know, what, I mean, do y'all have any idea how many, bird, how many caterpillars it takes to raise three baby birds or even two baby birds? Because I did not. And one of the things I learned was it takes 10,000 caterpillars to raise just two to three baby birds. And so if you have both parents trying to get, that's like four to 500 a day that they're having to feed those babies to get them to, to maturity, to, to be able to fledge and find their own. So something like the prothonotary warbler, if it doesn't have the right habitat, with enough like oak trees are what's attracting your, your caterpillars particularly, but like lots, you know, every plant has its own caterpillars, but oaks have over 500 species. 
that are attracted to it. So if you have uh, if you have lots and lots of oak trees, like like Chukchuma Swamp has, it's not just ag fields up to you know a little cypress duck hole as people call them. So the prothonotary warbler can just go in and out of the forest very quickly and feed those babies. Where it, 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 if it's having to fly miles each time to look for caterpillars, it's getting stressed and then it becomes food for a barred owl or some other you know hawk or something. Um, or it's starving its own self trying to feed its babies. So anyway, so I've, so anyway, all this is a long response is, um, all these little tropical birds who need caterpillars are having to go back to the tropics to find those caterpillars year round. Where are your woodpeckers who are looking for grubs and beetles and things under the bark, they can be here year round. And so can things like cardinals and um, if you begin to really notice you know, bird plant relationships, you almost don't even have to read a book once you understand that what a bird eats is whether it stays here year round or not. So cardinal looking for seeds and oh, they'll kind of eat anything, but, um, but they're, they're, you know, they can eat the seed heads. Uh, lots of birds can eat just the winter, you know, the seeds off of plants all year round. Um, and I, because y'all are gardeners, I can't help but want to say a lot of people want to keep their gardens really clean in the winter. But uh, if you really want to see birds or help birds, um, you really, it's best to leave all your, you know, your, your poke berries or that dried up or your elderberries, your sumac, all, anything you have that's dried and dead, your birds really need them uh, throughout the winter. Um, if, if you want to see them, but you know, once again, that doesn't feed the planter warbler, so he goes south. Okay. Um, all right. I think we've gone through all the questions people had, everything else. It's just a lot of comments. Everybody's inspired. They want to come out and grab a kayak. They want to do some, they want to experiment like your, like your kids were doing right. with using some natural pigments and doing their own art, seeing if they've got uh, maybe some inspiration in their fingers they didn't know about. Yes. And uh, so, uh, a lot, so a lot of appreciation. I know that for me personally, for this past hour, I have forgotten that it's January. I don't think <laughs> about it being winter. This was a wonderful break and a great way for us to start the year. So okay. I do appreciate appreciate this very much. Um, and again, uh, so that you've got, your, you've talked about your Facebook, you've got the friends group, you've right. got your uh, studio. Um, I know your uh, studio website has examples of your art in mm -hmm. addition to what you showed tonight. So um, hopefully everybody will take time the next few days to go out there and check those things out. Yeah. And uh, so thank you very much. And I'll go ahead and I'll, I'm going to stop the recording now. Okay.